Coming up on show 807, some crafty Canadians have hacked Tesla's software to give you an acceleration boost. Stick around and I'll tell you more. Plus on the podcast today, we're talking about the Ford slash VW joint venture, why the Dutch still love their e-golfs and their Model 3s, and how Hyundai and Kia are ramping up the pace of development of their heat pump technology. Well, good morning, good afternoon, maybe good evening. In fact, wherever you're listening around the world, welcome to EV News Daily, the edition for what happened on Friday 12th of June. My name is Martin Lee, and I go through every EV story so you don't have to, and I am indeed catching up with the podcast after a couple of days of spending nearly all of my time on the virtual Le Mans 24. Well, a couple of years ago, Ford and VW announced they'd explore the possibility of jointly developing EVs. Well, fast forward a year, and they expanded that partnership, and then today, fast forward another year, the two have been detailing some more specifics. Well, as early as next year in 2021, we could see the first of the commercial vans arriving. Two commercial vans actually arriving next year, part of the new Ford VW partnership. There's going to be a smaller city van that will be based on the latest VW Caddy. So whatever Ford's version of the Caddy will look like and the one-ton cargo van, uh, a, which will be a replacement for the Ford Transit. So something based on VW Tech, which will be the new Ford Transit van, says Motor One. Ford will also build an EV only for the European market. And I must remind you, by the way, of course, here in Europe, we have some very strict emissions regulations as of this year and getting um, stricter and certainly penalizing manufacturers more from next year and 2022 as well. And so Ford using Volkswagen's MEB platform, but that's only for the European market, at least one car will be arriving based on that. There'll be 8 million vans and trucks produced over the life cycle of this partnership, according to the both companies. And that doesn't include the estimated 600,000 EVs that Ford could be building every single year. And a reminder that the Mac E sits on its own a development platform from the ground up. They designed that. So this is something very, very different. It's the same underpinnings as all the VW electric cars, the ID3 and the ID4, the ID5, etc., etc. And Ford will be using that. Of course, styling and finish and the badge on the front, all Ford underneath a VW. Well, it might be old technology. The VW e Golf is still selling in many countries. And whilst it was cancelled last year because the ID3 was coming, they just carried on making it, and in fact, recently increased production of the e-Golf. And whilst it's not optimum EV technology, it doesn't go the farthest, doesn't go the quickest. They've stuffed the batteries where they can because it's a, a combustion car converted. Last month, we saw the good old e-Golf win its first ever monthly bestseller in 15 months in the Netherlands with 221 deliveries there. They're buying it a load in Germany as well. They absolutely love this car. Uh, edging out the Kia e Nero in the Netherlands last month's or the month before's bestseller along with the Kona. According to Clean Technica, other surprises last month were the plug-in hybrids from Volvo and Ford. So the Volvo XC40 plug-in and the Ford Cougar plug-in, which in the US you would call the Escape, and here we call the Cougar. And the best-selling plug-in hybrid being 118 units, so not the biggest numbers, but it's a big deal because... The Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in finally, finally, looks like it has some competition and at least earn its place in those top 10 lists. The Outlander has been a popular choice for plug-in buyers for years and years now. Well, lead story today. A Canadian garage has cracked Tesla's acceleration boost. The Tesla Model 3 long-range all-wheel drive and the performance versions are engineered very, very similarly. When Tesla first launched the production of the performance versions, saying that the motors would be specifically picked off the production line because those motors have a higher output, a higher performance would be used in those cars. However, more recently, there's been reports from people tearing them down and, and uh, just more recent production saying that basically both cars are the same. Obviously, the performance has some different things and brakes and carbon fiber spoiler, but otherwise, long-range all-wheel drive and performance all-wheel drive, obviously, Model 3 is basically the same car. 
give or take. And if you do own a long-range all-wheel drive, you can go back to Tesla any time now and ask for a bit more speed. They will relieve you of $2,000, and you can buy a an acceleration boost and unlo unlock a bit more performance. But what if you could bypass Tesla entirely and get your performance boost for half the price? Well, a garage in Quebec, Canada, and a chap called Simon Andre have figured out how to swap a single-motor Tesla Model 3 to a dual motor setup. And as part of that work, they had to bust into the inverter software and reconfigure it and have a tinker. Whilst they were in there, they hacked their way through Tesla's software and found a way of switching the dual motors, but also something else. It could also add horsepower. They could add 50 horsepower, which is basically the acceleration boost that Tesla will unlock over the air, obviously without any kind of clearance from Tesla's mothership headquarters. According to CNET, acceleration boost would normally set you back $2,000, which is quite an in-app purchase to make if you're feeling flush. Uh, but once this garage in Canada figured out how to do it and unlock the boost themselves, they've now released that as a product which you can buy from them. But they'll charge you just over $1,000 for what they call Boost 50 the Boost 50 upgrade. They will even do you a full conversion. They will even upgrade your car from a long-range all-wheel drive dual motor car to the performance spec. Uh, they call it a ghost upgrade, and that adds 150 horsepower to your car. Couple of caveats. You need to get the car to them. They won't just do it over the air like Tesla do. And also, I'm not sure how fondly Tesla will look upon those people that have done this in terms of warranty support. So not only will they be unimpressed with the garage doing what they will do at half the price, also I wouldn't like to be in a position of having gone the whole hog and upgraded an all-wheel drive Model 3 long range to the performance version and getting 150 horsepower extra and then all of a sudden Tesla release uh, a new over-the-air update, a new piece of software that magically happens in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden your car goes back to its original spec because they've <laughs> overwritten it. So maybe there's some things to think about here. Think very carefully before you have a little play with EVs, because EVs, you know, they're different to the cars that you might have grown up playing with, and a, a car that you can customise and mod Elon saying recently that he was in favour of people having a little play with the cars, but really, if it's taking money and business away from them, how dimly will Tesla look at this clever technology? I wouldn't do it personally, because all of a sudden you get in the car the next day, Tesla have changed it back again. <laughs> oh my goodness, I've spent all this money and they turned it back. Because they can. Because there's that old argument. We've had this on Question of the Week before. We've had this argument on the podcast before. We've talked about it plenty, plenty, plenty. But that argument of whose car is it? I mean, you say, well, it's mine. I just spent 40, 50, 60 grand on the car. But who really has ownership of the car? Because at any time, Tesla can do anything to it that they want. You know, cars have been written off. Uh, before or involved in a big accident and people who uh, you know are knowledgeable enough to do these things have taken the car that was scrapped and put it back on the road and and tesla saying well hang on no it means you can't use the superchargers in fact you can't use any dc fast charging because we we don't know if it's safe or not so literally turning off whole functions of the car which you thought you'd paid for one day it's going to be a big court case and we'll find out the answer you know, when somebody takes Tesla to court and says, look, it's my car, stop messing around with it. But until then, it's uh, it's an interesting question to have a think about. OK, moving on. A nice little story from Hyundai and Kia, because they're working on their heat pump technology. They believe that heat pumps are going to be a really important part of EVs going forward. So they're investing a lot in their R&D around that area. They have been using heat pumps in their EV since 2014, since the first generation Kia Soul EV. And now... Most, but not all, uh, EV makers put a heat pump in. Of course, Tesla only just added theirs to the Model Y most recently. As with other heat pumps and other EVs, the ones in Hyundai's and Kia's turn refrigerant from a liquid into a gas. That is used to heat the cabin. And it's more efficient than using resistive or resistance heating elements used in traditional uh, heating systems. It minimizes the amount of energy drawn 
from the battery pack, the all-important uh, measure of how efficient an EV is, says Green Car reports the latest system is able to scavenge heat from a wide array of components, including the drive motor, inverter, onboard charger, and the battery pack itself, according to Hyundai. The heat is what turns the liquid refrigerant into a gas. And a recent test of 20 EVs by the Norwegian Automotive Federation, the NAF, appeared to prove that Hyundai and Kia's are some of the most efficient out there. In that test, a European spec Kona Electric not only recorded the longest range in cold weather, it also came closest to its official WLTP range rating, achieving a 91% figure, 91% uh, of the total rated range in the very cold weather, I should say. Uh, they both say they're continuing to test and refine their heat pump technology and making additional improvements for their next generation of EVs. Well, the C4, the Citroen C4 Cactus, was one of the um, quirkiest looking recent Citroens and looked uh, kind of harkened back to the wacky style of older uh, Citroens. Uh, now it's going to be replaced by an all new model that ditches the Cactus from its name and is also more conventional looking and has a pure electric powertrain for the first time ever. It's an all-electric C4, which they're calling the EC4, or E-C4. And Citroen has now confirmed it will be officially unveiled on the 30th of June, according to Yahoo News, who say what we already knew about the model was that it was going to be on the same platform, the CMP platform, upon which cars like the Peugeot E208 and the E2008 are built, as well as the DS3 Crossback e tents the Vauxhall Corsa E, and the electric EC4, will feature the same battery pack and motor setup. So, 136 brake horsepower, 50 kilowatt hour battery pack, 100 kilowatt charge speed. The similar size of the Citroen C4 or EC4 is going to be equivalent, I would say, to the Peugeot E2008. So, WLTP range of that car is 193 miles, 310 Ks. I think the Citroen would be very, very similar. It all sits on the same kind of technology. It just depends what styling you want and what badge on the front and, and whether you like the slightly more uh, kind of quirky styling, some would say, of the Citroen. Or maybe you prefer it. That's what it's all about, really. Okay, right, finally, today... LG Chem has begun mass production of their NCM712 batteries in the first quarter of the year. They dramatically cut down on the use of cobalt in EV batteries. Seven parts nickel to one part cobalt and two parts manganese NCM712. There you go. It helps cut costs as well as helping the environment and the batteries have greater energy density, says Clean Technica. The LG Chem plant is the largest EV production facility in Europe, actually, and at the moment makes batteries for the Zoe and the Volkswagen Group. So the Audi e-tron, the Porsche Taycan batteries come from there. And these particular uh, cells, the E78 cells, uh, also being used in Volkswagen's ID3 and the new Renault Zoe. So if you have the new Zoe ZE50, uh, different, actually different cells, different chemistry to what they've been using in the ZE40. So my one uh, sitting in the driveway next to me is different, physically different chemistry in the cells to what is in the new Zoe ZE50. I'll pop a link to Clean Technica in the show notes if you would like to find out more. Okay, question of the week time. On Sunday, we'll read out your answers to how far you think a plug-in hybrid needs to go on EV power alone. What's the magical number? Uh, you can let me know about any thoughts on uh, the stories today or generally. My address is hello at evnewsdaily.com or leave a comment on the YouTube show. Thank you very much to 250. 30 patrons now of the podcast a new name to read out over the next couple of days if you'd like to find out what it's all about patreon is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash ev news daily 806 shows in the archive and that archive is paid for by patreon and my premium partners are phil roberts of electric future brad crosby avid technology brightsmith group for clean tech talents porsche of the village cincinnati audi of cincinnati east and new volvo cars 
of Cincinnati East. If you want to uh, check out the archive, you can do on the blog evnewsdaily.com. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid. <laughs>